are going to start today with a coverage of chapter 4 from our textbook and then continue on to chapter 5. And the topics we will cover are more of SQL starting with outer joints and uh, then we will move on to uh, JDBC. So, uh, first of all, uh, let us look at the concept of join relations in SQL. So far, we have seen the natural join construct. It turns out that the natural, we also saw the join using construct. Both of these are special cases of a more general class of join relations which SQL supports. In general, what is a join? A join takes two relations and returns uh, another relation as an output. And what is returned as output can be different, defined in many different ways. In general, the output is uh, you take the Cartesian product and then take a subset that is for an inner join. But for the case of outer join, it is actually a little bit different still. Let us look at some examples. So, uh, we are going to look at outer joins now. And we are going to take the following tiny relations as our running example for outer joins. So, we have a relation course which has um, three courses, bio 301, CS 190 and CS 315. And then we have relation prereq, which has uh, prereqs for bio 301 and CS 190 and a prereq for one more course, CS 347, which is not in the course relation, which of course is not possible if you have a foreign key dependency. Uh, so, how would you land up with such a relation? Well, we are just calling these relations as course and prereq for convenience. But they could be the result of a select on the course relation or a select on the prereq relation. And then we join the outputs of the select. So, this kind of situation could happen in that case. The prereq relation also on the right hand side it has three prereqs uh, bio 101 and uh, CS 101 uh, for two of the tuples. In this case, neither of those is present in the course relation. So, uh, what do we see here? First, prereq information is missing for 315 and B course information is missing for 347. It is also missing for the other three, but for the purpose of this example uh, that does not matter for us. So, now let us look at the first kind of outer join. We are going to start with natural outer join and then move to other uh, general kinds of outer join. So, supposing we take course natural left outer join prereq. So, first of all the keyword natural with join means that columns with the same name are equated. So, in this case what are the columns with the same name? Let me go back here. The only common in a column in common is course ID. So, we want to match things based on course ID. Supposing we did a natural join of these two, bio 301 would match, we would get an output. CS 190 would match, we would get an output. CS 315 on the other hand, CS 315 does not have any matching tuple here. So, in the result of a regular natural join, CS, the tuple with CS 315 would be dropped. In contrast, if we say natural left outer join, uh, of course, with prereq, we get this tuple CS 315 preserved. However, as we just saw, there is no matching tuple from the prereq relation. So, the result of a natural join has all the columns of the two relations. In this case, the course ID uh, column is common and the extra column is prereq ID. So, if we keep this particular tuple, it does not have a matching prereq tuple. So, what value do we put for prereq ID? We do not have a value, so we are going to set it to null. So, the result of an outer join is defined to have null values for the attributes from the other relation if a tuple does not match with anything. If you look here, bio 301 did match with a, a course on the prereq relation. It, therefore, we do not have an extra tuple for it with null values. It is also possible for bio 301 to match with two or three tuples from the uh, prereq relation. That is fine. At, it should have at least one match. If it does not have any match, then we add uh, it to the result with null values for the attributes from the right hand side relation in this case prereq. I hope that is clear. There is a symmetric case which is called natural right outer join. In right outer join we take the rows from the right hand side and make sure we do not lose any rows. So, again the basic principle of outer join is we preserve rows. A regular join loses rows which do not have a match. 
but there are many cases where do, we do not want to lose the rows. So, the outer join operation preserves those rows and fills values with from the other one with null. So, in this case, since we said right outer join, we are preserving rows from the right relation, which is prereq. Now, remember, prereq had CS347 with a prereq CS101, but there was no course uh, tuple for CS347. As a result, all the extra attributes from the course relation, meaning title, department name, credits, are all null over here. Only the course ID is not null because in this case it came from the right relation. So, in the natural uh, version of left outer and right outer join, the column course ID in, in our example came from both the relations. In, if there was a match, there would be two tuples, one for course, one for prereq, both of which have the same value for course ID. In the case where there is no match for one of the sides, the corresponding course ID does not exist on the other side, but because the natural join has just one copy of the column course ID, it is going to have just CS347 there, even though the course ID from course in this case was actually missing. There was no course ID from course, there was a course ID from prereq and that value comes over here. And finally, there is a full outer join. So, again sticking to the natural version of it, uh, course natural full outer join preserves rows from both sides. So, CS315 from course did not have a match in prereq, it is preserved with a null value for prereq ID. Similarly, CS347 from prereq did not have a match in course, but it is preserved with null values for title, department name and credits. So, I hope the natural version of outer joins are clear. But natural join is just one kind of join. We can actually uh, split the join condition into two parts. There is a, uh, a join operation into two parts rather. There is a join condition and then there is a join type. So, what are the join types? The first join type is inner join. This is actually the default. This is the one we have been looking at so far. And then we have the three types which we just saw, left outer, right outer and full outer. The join condition on the other hand is something which we have seen already. We have seen the natural join, we have seen using and the last one which we did not see before, but which we could have used already is on predicate. We did not bother with it because uh, for the inner join case you could always put it in the where clause, but as it turns out for left outer join you cannot always put it in the where clause. So, a join operation has to specify a join condition and a join type. Sometimes these are taken by default. When, when I say a natural join without saying left or right or full outer, then by default it is inner join. So, now here are some other examples of uh, joins, but this time not using natural join. Since we are not doing natural join, uh, columns with the same name from both sides are present and here in this table we are just showing the column twice, uh, but uh, remember that in SQL you would actually have a prefix here. So, in this case course inner join prereq on course dot course id equal to prereq dot course id, we have course id title department name credits, uh, there is a glitch in this table, uh, this should have been prereq id and uh, course id and not pre re id. So, course id appears twice, this course id is from prereq and this course id is from course. So, we could prefix it by course dot course id and prereq dot course id. So, this inner join is the usual join we have seen except we have written it as inner join on condition course dot course id equal to prereq dot course id. Instead of inner join we could have said left outer join and that is what the second example is course left outer join prereq on course course id equal to prereq course id. What has happened now? Since it is left outer join with course on the left hand side, course has to be preserved. So, the course CS315 which did not have a match in prereq is present, but now you will see that the attributes from prereq are all null including the course id attribute from prereq is null and of course, the prereq id attribute from course id is null. In the natural join case, this course id and this course id were combined and uh, essentially the non null value was retained. For the non natural, the normal case with a condition, both copies are preserved. So, uh, 
we have already seen this course natural right outer join um, and we also have course right outer join using a course ID. In this case, uh, it is basically the same as the natural right outer join. By the way, all of these slides have uh, prereq written by mistake as pre re, do not worry about that. But this example is uh, something which we uh, saw earlier. Uh, it is the same thing except it is written using the using clause. So, this is a good time for a quiz. Uh, there are actually two questions in this slide. Uh, the uh, first question is the one which I will enable first, then give you a little time for the second question as well. Quiz question is actually very easy. Uh, it says our left, our left outer join S and S right outer join R the same if we ignore the order of columns. Now, why is this part of ignoring the order of columns? In SQL, the output of any join uh, like this has the columns of the left relation first followed by the columns of the right relation. Now, for the natural join case, uh, duplicate columns are present only uh, from where they appear in the left relation. They do not uh, appear in the positions that they would have been in the right relation. So, these two queries definitely uh, because we have flipped R and S, the order of columns is going to be different. However, if we ignore the order of columns, uh, in both cases we are preserving tuples from R and uh, S tuples if they do not have a match they are dropped. So, they are actually equivalent and the answer is A. So, the question here is which of the following give exactly the same results given two relations R A B and S B C. So, the common attribute is B. So, the natural join will equate things on attribute B. So, R natural join S is really the same as R join S using B because the using clause specifies which columns are to be equated. In this case, it is uh, the only uh, common attribute is B which is there in the using clause. So, that is actually equivalent to the natural join. However, is it equivalent to the next one which is R join S on R dot B equal to S dot B? Well, it is almost the same, but it is not. And the difference as we saw a couple of slides down is that the third query R join S on R dot B equal to S dot B, it has two copies of column B. It has a column from R and a, and a copy from S. So, it is not exactly the same result. It is equivalent in some sense because uh, the columns have the same value, but there is an extra copy of the column. So, A and C are not really the same, uh, A and B are the same and of course, B and C are not the same. So, the right answer is 1. I will take questions on outer joints in just a little bit after briefly covering view definition. We already saw some kind of view definitions using the width clause. There the width clause defines a temporary relation which is available only to the query. A view is very similar except that it is stored in the database and can be accessed just like a regular relation. So, a uh, view is defined using a create view as a query expression and once it is defined it is in the database, but what is stored in the database is the name of the view. By default there is no actual content or in terms of tuples for the view. It is only the view definition which is stored. So, note that defining a view is not the same as creating a new relation by evaluating the query expression. What do I mean? Instead of saying create view as some query, I can say create table as select star from you know something query expression. What does this latter one do? It creates a table which basically has the same schema, same attributes but it fills up the table with rows from the uh, result of evaluating the query. The issue is the following, the difference is the following though. In the first case when you say create view, supposing we change the contents of one of the uh, tables used in the view definition. Automatically the contents of the view conceptually changes because it is not actually stored. It is defined as the result of evaluating the query. If I change one of the underlying relations, I re-execute the query, I am going to get a new result. But if I computed the whole table and stored it, it is not going to change, it is fixed. So, it is not really the same thing as evaluating a query and storing it. However, there is some connection and I will come back to that in the context of what are called materialized views. So, before we look at that, here are some examples of views uh, and some of the motivations for views. 
So one kind of motivation for view is if we want to make a relation available to somebody, but we want to hide certain columns. So in this case, what you have said is create view faculty as select ID name department name from instructor. That is over here. What have we done here? We have simply removed the column salary. Maybe a salary is something which we do not want to expose to certain people. For example, uh, this view might be made available to everyone because we want people to know who are the instructors and what is their name, what is their department, but we do not want everyone to see the salary. Now, how do we use the view? You could use it in a query. <coughs> so, here is a query select name from faculty. This is the view we define where department name is biology and that is executed. Uh, how is it executed? Conceptually, faculty over here is replaced by this thing. Think of it as becoming a sub query in the from clause, which is select ID name blah blah from instructor. That is the sub query and then that is the resultant query which is executed. So, when we write a query on a view, basically the semantics is that the view name is replaced by the view definition. Another use of views which is very common in the context of uh, uh, you know decision support systems where we want to pre-compute certain things and store it. Uh, so, they are actually it is a little different from normal views, but first let us look at what this view is and then we will see later why it is particularly useful. So, this view creates a view of department salary total. Maybe we want to publish the total salary in a department without uh, publishing the individual salary. So, what do we do? Create view department total salary, department name total salary, those are attributes as select department name from salary from instructor group by department name. Now, of course, in this case, a department with no instructor will not appear in here. If we wanted that, we could have written a slightly different query. Uh, as we saw yesterday. If you recall that query was to um, select a uh, star from uh, not not select department name comma and then a sub query which computes the total number of uh, total salary in that department. We did it for count yesterday, but a small variant of that um, maybe I will uh, cover that in a little bit um, coming up. So, the idea is we can write a query like this and create a view and then we can use it. Now, I told you that you can uh, use a view in a query, but you can also use a view to define another view. So, here is one view, do not uh, really bother about this whole definition, uh, just look at the name of the view, create view physics fall 2009. Intuitively, it is selecting the courses um, which the course ID, sec ID, building room, uh, whatever, some part of the uh, section information for physics courses which run in fall 2009. So, that is a view definition. Now, why would you do this? It is a toy example, it is not real. And now, finally, the second view is physics fall 2009 Watson, which says I only want those courses where the building is Watson. Okay. So, maybe uh, there can be courses with run in different buildings. Note that this is not the uh, department building, this is the uh, building of the classroom in which the course occur, uh, course runs. Okay. So, maybe uh, some of the physics courses run in Watson, some run in a different room. This is a uh, view defined in terms of the previous view. So, you can cascade views. So, in general, how do you define what it means, uh, what is the semantics when a query uses a view? The answer is you replace the name of the view by the definition of a view and that is what happens here. So, this may happen, this may have to be done uh, more than once. So, over here, um, this one create view physics fall 2009 has a use of a view here. And what we have done is replace this one relation name here by a subquery. The subquery starts here and ends here. This subquery was actually the definition of that view. So, we have replaced it. Now, this is the definition of the view physics 2009, fall 2009 Watson. 
So, uh, in general, the uh, semantics is we take a query. If there is a view in the query, we replace the view relation by the expression defining v. But the result of this replacement may still have other view names present in it. May have been present in the original query. There may be multiple views, or the replacement uh, resulted in a new query, which itself had a view name. The replacement, the, that is the view definition, itself used another view. So this may have to be done multiple times. As long as you find a view name in the query, which, not, uh, which is not an actual relation but a view, we keep replacing it. And we stop when no more view relations are present. So it's intuitively very simple. Um, since the SQL language actually allows subqueries in the from clause, if a view name appears in the from clause, we simply replace it by the uh, definition of the view. So this works as long as view definitions are not recursive. Now what is a recursive view definition? Why is it useful? We are going to see it a little bit later in chapter 5. Uh, and those are handled differently. But as long as the view definition is not recursive, it is okay. And what do we mean by recursive view definition? You all know what is a recursive procedure. A recursive procedure is one which is defined in terms of itself. Could be directly, meaning the procedure calls itself. It could be indirectly. Procedure A calls B, which calls C, which eventually calls A again. So there is a recursion. Similarly, view definitions can have recursion. View A can be defined in terms of view B, view B can be defined in terms of view A. If you do this view expansion for a query which uses A, the definition of A is uh, put in place and now it has a view name B. If you expand that, the definition of B has view name A and then we are back to square one and it keeps going on and on. It never ends. So recursive view definitions cannot be handled like this, but non-recursive ones it is very easy to see how view expansion works. So I think this is a good point to take some questions. We have covered uh, outer joins and views. So let us take some questions. After that we will come back to um, the uh, view updates and then other topics. So we will uh, take at this point Walchan Institute. Walchan? Yes, uh, sir, sure. my question is: We can uh, use exist clause in place of in clause, and vice versa. Okay. Yeah, this question was asked yesterday. Let me use the whiteboard and answer that question with an example. So, uh, to repeat the question for the benefit of other, uh, the question is: Can you use an in clause or an exist clause interchangeably? And the answer is: uh, Any query with an in clause usually can be rewritten using an uh, exist clause. And vice versa is a little bit harder, but it is possible. Uh, it is not so simple though. So let me show this first direction. Supposing we have a query, I will keep the query simple. Select star from r, where r dot a in select a from s. I am just keeping the query extremely simple, but the same idea works in general. So what do we have here? Uh, we have um, query outer query relation R and the in clause makes sure that uh, value in R dot A should appear in S. Now we can easily rewrite this query using a join, uh, well modulo duplicates. If we ignore duplicates, you know, it is easy. With duplicates, it is a bit tougher. But the question is with respect to uh, the exist clause. So the same query can be rewritten as follows. Select star from R where, now note that we are checking if R dot A in S dot A essentially. So we are going to rewrite this query as exists select anything, I do not care what it is. I could say select star, I could even say select 1. What does select 1 mean? Select the constant value 1, it does not matter what I put there. From S, where S dot A equal to R dot A. Note that this R dot A over here is actually coming from this R over here. 
So, the semantics is for a particular tuple of R, I am going to execute this query which selects S tuples with the same value of A and outputs a tuple with a, just a field 1. I, I could have called it R dot A, I could have said star, it does not matter. The bottom line is that this subquery succeeds if there is at least one tuple in the result, which means there is at least one S tuple with the same value of R dot A. Then that particular R tuple comes in the output. And that is exactly the same as this query. In this query, a R tuple comes in output as long as its R dot A value is present in some tuple in S. So, these two are actually entirely equivalent. Now, there is another um, almost equivalent, but not query, which is select R dot star from R um, comma S, where R dot A equal to S dot A. What is this doing? It is outputting R tuples, which have a matching S tuple. So, it is almost the same query, but there is a very minor difference. And that difference is, how many times does a particular R tuple get output? In the first two cases, in this case and in this case, an R tuple gets output exactly once. Even if it matches many S tuples, it gets output exactly once, because the in clause succeeds only once regardless of how many S tuples match. Similarly, the exist clause is done only once, regardless of how many S tuples match. But if you come down here, that R tuple is output many times. How many times? As many as there are S tuples matching it. So, we might say select distinct. That is very close in most cases, as long as it is R dot star and R has a primary key, this is actually now equivalent because the duplicates are removed. But it is a little tricky because instead of star, if I had let us say select r dot d, this was also r dot d and here too I made it r dot d instead of star. Now, what happens? In this case, a particular value in r dot b will appear once per tuple. So, if there are two tuples with the same value of r dot b, that value will appear twice. So, if there are, let me repeat, if there are two tuples in R with the same value of R dot B, that value of R dot B will appear twice in this first query. In the second query also, it is going to be exactly the same. But in the third query, because we said select distinct R dot B, that value is going to appear exactly once. So, it is not exactly the same uh, as the previous two. If you want to make it the same, uh, it's, there is a more complex way of doing it by first projecting a primary key also of R. So, instead of distinct R dot D, I will let us say R dot A is the primary key. So, I will have to do distinct R dot A comma R dot B and then I enclose this in an outer query which says uh, select R dot B from this inner query. So, what we are doing is first uh, select distinct r dot a r dot b in the inner query that will remove duplicate r tuples which were introduced because of multiple s matches. But if a particular s dot b value appears in two different r tuples, th those two r tuples will still exist in this result because we included the primary key r dot a in the select distinct. So, they will be two separate tuples as is and then finally select r dot b will get you the correct answer. So, if you want to preserve duplicate counts, you have to jump through a few hoops like this. So, this is a small example, but this idea can be generalized. I hope that answers your question. Let us uh, come back sir, to you. Um, uh, sir, in terms of uh, in terms of execution time, in terms of execution time, hmm. using exist is better or in clause? Is it depend on the inner query? Okay. So, the question is in terms of execution time, is it better to use the in clause or the exist clause. Um, the answer is most databases will be able to transform one to the other. So, I would not expect any difference between the in and the exist clause, because that if you use the in clause, it is very easy to transform it to the exist version. Unless it is a very uh, naively implemented database, then yes, you could see a difference. But my guess is on most databases, you will not see a difference, because this is a very easy case. But when there are more complex cases, uh, transforming is harder and uh, then you might get different execution times. 
Okay, Shanmuga College. Uh, can you give us an idea about uh, object-oriented database and relational database, which will be the best for the real-time applications? Uh, object-oriented databases are different from relational databases in the sense that they explicitly model objects and uh, then objects have uh, methods and so forth. Uh, then they model inheritance uh, and many other such features. Now, there was a time when there were many companies which were building object-oriented databases. This was back in the uh, late, uh, mid to late 1980s, that long ago. Object-oriented databases were considered a very hot topic, a lot of research in that area. But they didn't take off commercially uh, for reasons which uh, basically were, were the following. There were some technical and some non-technical reasons. So the first thing about object-oriented databases, the motivation for that is, was to integrate the database with a programming language. So the idea was, instead of writing an SQL query and uh, you know, uh, creating a result set, getting values back, we are going to see that in a little while, uh, in, after the break, you're going to cover JDBC, and you're uh, going to see how clumsy it is to get values from the database. It's a bit of a pain. The idea of object-oriented databases was to make this easier, that it should be very easy to get a value from the database without writing a query. You should just be able to access it as if it's an object and a field of an object. So the original object-oriented databases, um, all those companies, there were many, they all died more or less. I think one or two of them are badly alive. Uh, but none of them succeeded because that's not what the marketplace needed. Sure, uh, the impedance mismatch was important for certain applications. But many other applications did actually want the relational model. And they were not comfortable going over to objects. That was one aspect. There was also another issue which was uh, that that generation of object-oriented databases lacked many features which SQL databases provided, including a good query language, which was very important for many people. Uh, they didn't do concurrency control and other such things very well. So there were many drawbacks. They did certain things. There was a lot of interesting research which came out. But the uh, companies died. Now, but the basic idea has not gone away. It has come back in several forms. At some point, uh, when uh, J2EE was big, the beans and the bean persistence and so on were hot topics for some time, which was in some sense a renewal of the same object-oriented idea. But these things also fell by the wayside for more or less the same reasons. They didn't have uh, features which uh, most databases need, including uh, recovery, concurrency control, blah, blah, blah. Today, there is a new variant of it, which is actually fairly popular. And that is object uh, relational mapping which basically gives an object view of data, but the underlying data is actually in a regular relational database. So if you want to write your queries, sure, write them in SQL. Do you get concurrency control recovery? Yes, because you're using a regular relational database. But if your application wants to view data as objects without writing SQL, you can. Okay, so these systems are called object relational mapping or ORM systems. Let me just write it down here. So these systems are called object relational mapping or ORM systems. And there are several of them. Uh, the most popular of them is an, uh, actually an open source thing called Hibernate. So what is it about Hibernate that makes it popular? And it's actually very widely used today. It's something which uh, you should learn about. And the reason it is popular is, A, you know, it did away with all the problems of the old object-oriented databases by using a relational database underneath. But it makes it easy for programmers to write applications without even knowing SQL. So how does it pull off this trick? Basically, it has a notion of an object. So an object in Java, for example, which is mapped to tuples in SQL. So supposing we have an uh, instructor relation here. Instructor relations might have corresponding instructor objects. And a hibernate can be used from multiple languages. Let's take the Java thing. That's the key thing. The Java 
version. So, the instructor object in Java is mapped to an instructor tuple. So, on this side it is an object, in this side it is a tuple. So, the instructor object is mapped to an instructor tuple. Now, how is this mapping done? We say that uh, we define the class instructor class in Java and the fields of that class are mapped to attributes of the relation. And moreover, uh, there is a way to say get this object with a specified key value and that key value will be the primary key of the relation. So, in this case the instructor relation has an ID. So, in the Java side we will just say um, get uh, instructor with a given ID and the programmer does not need to look at the SQL query, but this hibernate system actually generates an SQL query which is sent to the database. It fetches the instructor data, brings it back and fills in the fields of an instructor object and returns that. And then the programmer simply accesses the fields or methods of that object. So, it makes it very easy to access a database and it has been popular for two reasons. Uh, one is it uh, reduces the amount of code that a programmer has to write. The second interesting reason is that it gives you database independence. Let me write it here. What do we mean by database independence? You can write your program in Hibernate and run it on a PostgreSQL database today. And tomorrow, you can run the same program on a Oracle database without changing the program at all. All you have to do is change the uh, mapping definition. Even that more or less works because it is mostly database independent. So, you can just retarget the application to run on Oracle and it will run with no changes. What is the magic? We have seen that SQL for Postgres and SQL for Oracle are slightly different. The Hibernate system hides these differences and it will generate appropriate SQL for Oracle or PostgreSQL or whatever else you choose uh, and give you the same object view of data. Uh, so, many applications have been built with that. Uh, so, recently National Securities Depository was building a new application and they were consulting Professor Fartak. And uh, Professor Fartak told them use Hibernate. It was a new technology to them at that point. They were not sure, uh, but they went ahead and tried it out and they were very happy with it. And the reason is not just that it was slightly easier to write the application. The bigger reason is that now they could uh, deal with Oracle and uh, IBM and Microsoft and say that, look, we can run our application on any one of your databases. It is very easy for us to switch and you know, you better bid low for us to select you. So, they had to bid lower and uh, the price that NSDL paid for their database system was a lot less than it would have been if they had written the application using raw SQL. Why? Because then you are forced to write to a particular database. If you write SQL which works with Oracle, it will not work unchanged on SQL Server. You have to go make changes. You have to test it again. It is a lot of work. Um, and even between Postgres and uh, SQL Server, Postgres and Oracle, every one of these you have to go rewrite stuff. So, that is actually a very interesting reason why Hibernate is doing well. So, why is Hibernate not replaced SQL totally? Well, there are some reasons. The first thing is that if you are writing queries which access a lot of data, it turns out Hibernate is pretty slow for that. It is terrible in fact. So, if you want to write complex queries, you really do not want to write it in Hibernate. Uh, you want to write it directly in SQL. So, uh, that is the reason why Hibernate cannot replace uh, SQL totally for applications. Now, I, uh, the next question is why is Hibernate slow? Why cannot it run faster on queries? And we, th this is actually a very interesting research problem. You know, um, This is a problem which we looked at uh, not originally in the context of Hibernate, but more in the context of web applications. Um, and we said, look, here is a database program. A database application which accesses a database and it is very slow because it makes many different accesses to the database. Can we speed it up somehow? And so, we uh, came up with ways of actually going and rewriting Java code uh, in order to improve database access. So, this is part of a project at IIT Bombay which we call holistic optimization. Holistic because the optimization is not in the database it even spans program langu programming language rewriting, Java code rewriting. 
And it turns out that some of the techniques we developed in that context can be used to optimize hibernate programs also. So, uh, we have shown that our techniques can be used. Uh, it is not a product uh, at this point, but we have shown that it is feasible. So, maybe if some of these techniques uh, improve over time and become more stable, um, hibernate could be used even in other settings. Okay, so, that was a long answer to a short question, uh, which went completely out of topic. Let us come back and uh, deal with a few more questions. Yes, yes sir. You have an idea, sir. Yes, sir. You have given us proper explanation, sir. This is also useful for us research also. We are thinking about this topic and relation database and um, object -oriented database, which is the best and which is which is used for real time applications. Then this topic and all we are all thinking to thinking to do research, sir. So that this your information is very much useful for us. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Okay, I'll take a few questions from chat. Okay, the first question is uh, comparison between view and width clause, and the second question is whether views are stored permanently inside the database. These two are related questions uh, asked by the same person. So, as I explained uh, yesterday when I covered the width clause, the width clause definition is not stored in the database. It is only available to the particular query in which it is used. In contrast, the view definition is actually stored in the database and any other query can use that view definition. So, the syntax is almost the same except that the width clause is part of a query whereas the view is um, defined in and stored in the database and can be used for any query. Uh, another question is what are the practical applications of views in real life? Uh, so, there are many applications of views. Uh, sometimes you want to uh, take data which is stored in two different relations and provide a join view on that. So, why are they in two different relations? Maybe because of normalization, things got broken up into two relations. Uh, and now, to make it easier for people to view the data, you might need, a, need to join the two relations and a view provides that. So, you can have normalization and still you can have simpler queries which do not have to do the join. The join is already done in the view definition. Then you can have aggregate views of the kind we saw, uh, which uh, may be a little difficult to write, but you can define the view and then uh, let people access the view to get aggregate statistics. In fact, you can go one step further and uh, do what is called view materialization. So, let me use the whiteboard and just give this uh, term there. So, what is view materialization? The idea is if I define a view, create view v as some query q 1. So, the normal view definition simply stores the text of the query in the database. The view is stored defined by the text of the query. But if I have an aggregate view which may take a long time to execute, it is sometimes useful to actually execute the query and store the result in the database. So, uh, many databases support a variant of this which is they have different syntax, but if you specify materialized here, okay, create materialized view v as q 1, then q 1 is executed and the result is stored as a table in the database. So, now view v actually has data. If you access v, it will access the underlying data. The problem with this as I said is that the uh, if, if uh, q 1 uses a relation r and I insert something into r insert into r something. Now, the result of q 1 has changed because r has changed, but the materialized view has an old result. It is no longer consistent with the current state of r. That is a problem with materializing a view. So, you have to update the view to make it again consistent with r. So, how do you do this? You can recompute. So, I just run the query q 1 again, throw out all the tuples in v and replace them by the new tuples, but this can be expensive. So, many databases will allow you to keep a view which is somewhat out of date. In particular for aggregates, most of the time I do not care if the aggregate is consistent as of yesterday. I do not necessarily need today's data to be included in the aggregate, because I am using it as statistics for some decision making 
and I do not care about today's values, yesterday's values are good enough. And so, every night you will recompute the view and uh, it will be up to date as of last night. There is another option which some database support which is called incremental What is incremental view maintenance? The idea is as soon as I insert a tuple in R, the database will figure out how to update V to reflect that change in R. Now, if you have to recompute whole, the whole V, that is going to take a long time. So, that is not a good idea at all. So, you should be able to make just the required changes to V to reflect the changes to R. Now, with complex queries, this is actually quite hard. So, those databases which support incremental view maintenance they put a restriction on the views. You cannot have arbitrary queries, you, the queries have to be relatively simple and for those queries, they will give you the option of immediately updating V as soon as R is updated. So, uh, views are very widely used for many reasons including all of these. Okay, I will take one more from chat. Okay, somebody wants to know what is a semi join. Okay, semi join is a relational algebra operator. Uh, which is defined in terms of the join operation. So, if you just want the formal definition of semi join, so what is the semi join operation? It is like the join operation, but slightly different, and it is denoted like this in the relational algebra. So, R semi join S. Uh, there are again the natural and the condition theta version. R semi join S is defined as project on. So, let us say that we have relations R whose attributes are denoted by capital R, S whose attributes are denoted by capital S. So, this is capital S. So, this R semi join S is defined as project on the attributes of R of R join S. At least this is the set version, the multi set version is a little uh, slightly more complicated, but what is the basic idea? Conceptually whether it is a set or multi set version, the semi join of uh, R semi join S is those tuples in R that match at least one tuple S. Those tuples in R that do not match any tuple in S are thrown out. Now, this was for the natural join, there is also a theta version what is uh, theta denote here? Theta is any condition. So, theta could be for example, r dot a uh, equal to s dot b, that is the join condition. Theta could be any condition like this. So, semi join theta is defined as the same thing, the join theta with, with join on that condition. So, in SQL terms it would be r join s on that condition, that is what a theta join. So, this is called a theta join or the theta semi join correspondingly. So, that is a formal definition of a semi join operation. Now, why is this useful? There are um, many uses inside of a database uh, query engine for semi joins. In particular, uh, subqueries like uh, let us say the in or exists subqueries are often translated internally to semi joins, it is an uh, efficient way of dealing with them. Uh, and then the not in queries are translated to something called a anti semi join. Okay, so, this is used to translate not in queries. I would not give you the exact translation, I will for lack of time, but I just want to give you the intuition that uh, this is what the semi join operation is used for in centralized databases. Now, in the context of distributed databases, semi join operations were used to minimize data transfer. Supposing R is in site 1 and S is in site 2, if I want to compute R join S at site 2, I want the result at site 2, but S is a small relation and R is a big relation. And very few tuples of R join with tuples of S, then I could copy S over here, send S and at this site, I will compute R semi join S, meaning I will find those R tuples that match one of the S tuples at least, ship that over 
and complete the join by uh, taking this result, let us say T 1 equal to this, I ship T 1, T 1 join with S that is equivalent to R join S. But the difference is that I have sent over not all of R, but only those R tuples which match at least one S tuple. So, this can be more efficient than sending all of R. So, semi joins are also used in distributed database systems uh, for uh, to optimize data transfer. So, there are many applications of the semi join operation. Mostly you would not see it if you write SQL, but um, it is good to mention it because it reappears in the context of query processing. Okay, so let us go back to and take maybe one more question. Sadar Patel Institute and Dheri, please go ahead if you have a question. Yeah. How does view help in database security? So, the, uh, to repeat the question for the benefit of others, the question is how do views help in database security? I give you an example where uh, I projected away uh, the salary attribute in the view definition so that that is not visible to others. So, that is one aspect of security, uh, privacy. Uh, there is another aspect of views uh, which can project out certain rows. Supposing you know I want to make available to people in one department only information about that department. Let us say you know I have uh, in a university, I have uh, details about all students of the university, but I want instructors from computer science to view only data about computer science students, not about other students. So, now I can define a view that looks like this. Let me go back to the whiteboard. Create view CS student as select star from student where department name equal to, uh, to use our sample data it would have to be com dot psi dot. Okay, so, that is the view and now we can uh, give access to this view to people in computer science, but we may not grant access to all of the student relation to people in computer science. Now, this security, th th this aspect talks of granting privileges and that is actually coming up later in this chapter. So, I will cover that uh, at the end of chapter 4. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes sir. What are read only views? That is a, a very good uh, question which actually takes us into the next few slides, which is you know I said that a view is a relation and you can use it in queries, but can you perform updates on views? What does it make sense to allow you to update a view? So, let us say that uh, I gave this view which I just showed you which is computer science students and granted it to people in computer science. Are they allowed to make changes to that uh, the view CS student? Now, the view is not actually stored unless it is a materialized view. Let us forget about materialized views for the moment. A regular view, the tuples are not stored. So, if I want to make a change to the view CS student, I actually have to go and update the student relation. Should it be allowed? Can there be problems? These are the issues which come up. And the simplest way is to say no, you are not allowed to do any updates to a view and that is fine, you know that is a valid option. But there are many situations where uh, you want to grant access and also allow updates of certain kinds. So, before we uh, see what updates are allowed, let us see what are the potential problems if we allow updates on views. So, I am going to cut you off and go back to the slides. So, let us uh, come to view updates. So, Remember the faculty view which we saw earlier, maybe I since it has been a few minutes, let me just go back and show you the faculty view that is here. Create view faculty as select ID name department name from instructor. The only thing which we have removed is the salary attribute. So, that is the faculty view. Now, supposing we want to allow insert into faculty values uh, some ID, uh, the name is green and the department is music. Can we do this? There is no actual uh, set of tuples for the view faculty, it is just a view definition, but we can actually go and insert a tuple into the instructor relation 
uh, which has the effect of performing this insert. What is it that we add to the instructor relation? We can add this tuple into the instructor relation. ID 3075, name green, department music, salary, ah, what about salary? The view faculty did not have a salary column, so there is no way to even specify it. So, if you want to insert a tuple to instructor, what is the salary value? And the answer is null as usual. If you do not provide a value, we could make it null. In fact, the SQL language provides another concept, which is to say that for this attribute, you can define default value something. So, for, for example, um, let us say salary. And if you do not have a, specify a salary, we want to say salary is 0 because maybe there are many people with 0 salary, honorary people. So, what you can do is in the table definition, we can say uh, salary uh, numeric 62 default 0. In which case, if you insert a tuple like this, instead of null, the value would be 0. So, this particular insert into faculty can be translated into an insert on the underlying instructor relation. So, this view or update of a view is translatable. However, it is not life is not always this easy. And by the way, many SQL implementations will allow this situation. They will allow updates on views, which are simple like this. The view was simply a projection view. As long as the columns which are removed can be either set to null or they have a default value. If one of these two conditions is satisfied, many SQL implementations will allow you to update simple projection views and similarly selection views, but there are some other issues in selection views which are coming up.